Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome for uh, this uh, new colloquium by the Instituto Astrofisica de Andalucía. Today, uh, we will have the talk by Dr. Jason Hessels from the University of Amsterdam and Astron. And uh, he will talk about exploring the transient radio sky with sky, with sky and its precursors. So thank you, Jason, for uh, being here. And uh, Isabel Marquez, our scientific director, will make a proper introduction uh, of you. Isabel? OK, thank you very much, René. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being here again to visit a, 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 new, a new one, I mean, a, a new colloquium from the Severo Ochoa program at, at the Instituto Astrofisica de Andalucía. It's a pleasure for us, as René has said, to have to, today Professor Jason Hessels with us. Thank you very much, uh, Jason, for accepting an invitation that I, I'd like to, I mean, publicly express the, the extension of the invitation to an in-person one next, for next October. So uh, thank you very much. Professor Hessels received his PhD in 2007 from McGill University in, in Canada. And since, since then, he has been working in the Netherlands, where he's now professor of high energy astrophysics at the University of Amsterdam, and uh, he's also chief uh, astronomer at Astron, that is the Netherlands Institute for, for Radio Astronomy, as you know. His research focuses on the study of pulsars and fast uh, radio bursts. He has studied this uh, phenomena, primarily using large uh, radio telescopes, and this research has been funded uh, via a number of grants from the European Research Council and uh, the Dutch Foundation of Scientific Research. Uh, research highlights uh, include the discoveries of the fastest spinning and most massive neutron star, as well as the discovery of the first known repeating re fast radio burst source. His research group is uh, currently focused primarily on localizing fast radio bursts to the host uh, galaxies and local environments using a uh, very long baseline interferometry. He is co-chair of the SKA Trinity and Science Working Group, and he's also a project scientist uh, uh, for the LOFAR 2.0 upgrade uh, to low frequency array. And as René said, he's talking today about exploring the transient radio sky with SKA and its precursors. So thanks again, uh, uh, Jason, and uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, uh, Isabel, um, for the nice introduction. I'll start sharing my my screen now. Uh, of course, uh, I'm very much looking forward to, to seeing you uh, in person at some point. Uh, can I just confirm that you can see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. Great. Um, so indeed, I'm going to be talking about exploring the, the transient uh, sky using the square kilometer array and its precursors. The way I've structured the talk is I'm first going to talk about uh, the SK and some broad terms and in, in terms of uh, you know what we hope to do with, uh, with transients. And then I'm going to focus, I'm going to go deeper on, on one of the really exciting uh, science cases for, for SK, fast radio bursts, also as a means of you know, showing you the kind of the depth of the science that, that one can do, um, and also using it as, as a way of showing kind of the exploration that we're still making of the, the transient radio sky and what the prospects are for, for increasing that with the, the square kilometer array. So first off, let me let me talk a little bit about the square kilometer array, um, and especially in the context of transients. I'm going to assume that the vast majority, if not all of the audience, has heard of the square kilometer array. If you haven't, it's going to be a, a two site, uh, in terms of telescopes at least, uh, radio telescope, which is going to be preeminent in the world. It's going to be uh, construction has started already on the SK, which is very, very exciting. And towards the end of this decade, we will be making observations with the full SK uh, observatory. And that includes uh, the square kilometer array mid telescope, which is going to be hosted in South Africa, which is going to be a major extension of what already exists in terms of the Meer Meerkat uh, telescope there in, in South Africa. As well as, quite importantly, also in Western Australia, the, the square kilometer array low array, which will be providing lower radio frequencies, meter wavelengths, um, and is a telescope that uh, is going to be an order of magnitude more collecting area than the current uh, LOFAR telescope, the low frequency array that we have in, in Europe. 
So this is really going to be a preeminent telescope, and it's not just one telescope, it's, it's two telescopes covering a very broad range of radio frequencies, providing high angular resolution, huge sensitivity. And of course, we want to use that for a wide variety of science cases. And the one that's closest to my heart and uh, associated with the, the science working group that I lead is, of course, transients. And there is no way that I can do justice to all of these, these very interesting areas of transient radio astronomy in, in a single talk. That's why I've chosen to, to dig deeper into just one of the topics later in the talk. But let me just give you an idea of what the breadth of, of different scientific topics is. And this, this list is, of course, also not, uh, not exhaustive. Um, you've undoubtedly uh, heard of the revolution uh, that is happening in multi-messenger, multi-wavelength astronomy. Uh, radio astronomy plays an important role in following up gravitational wave events, uh, in particular the kilonovae that they can produce. So I have a couple examples here of, uh, of radio observations, of VLBI observations resolving the evolving uh, morphology and position of radio emission associated with the first uh, double neutron star merger, the famous gravitational wave event 1708-17, as well as tracking the, the afterglow emission of that uh, of that event, this is these are really interesting uh, events in terms of understanding the production of heavy elements in our universe. So uh, elements beyond uh, beyond iron, there are elements in the periodic table, quite a few of them that are predominantly formed, we believe, through this type of process, and uh, and really nailing down, you know, what fractions of different types of elements are produced. Um, Using these 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 events as probes of that uh, creation of the periodic tables is really very exciting. I'm going to talk about fast radio bursts in, in much more detail later in the talk, so I'm not going to, to elaborate on them right now. I'll be explaining what they are as well. One of the things that I think is super exciting for, for the square kilometer array is really probing relativistic jets from both neutron stars and black holes over a huge range of mass scales. So I'm talking about even stellar mass black holes up to supermassive black holes, of course, and particularly neutron stars, since they also form jets uh, in a almost uncannily uh, similar way to how, how accreting black holes form jets, um, they are typically much weaker, but with a much larger telescope like the SK, I think there's a huge avenue for exploring accretion onto neutron stars and, uh, and also outflows from neutron stars uh, using the SK. And I have an, an example here. This is not a neutron star. This is a black hole, but beautiful work that was done by James Miller Jones et al. Collaborators looking at a processing jet from a black hole and, and doing this type of work is uh, currently, you know, groundbreaking to be able to do this. I think this is something that will become, you know, routine with the SK and be able to, to trace processing jets of accreting compact objects. Of course, there's a whole variety of different types of supernovae. We have long gamma ray bursts, we have superluminous supernovae. There's a whole zoo now of different types of supernovae, many of which produce detectable radio emission. Uh, we'll be able to study those uh, with the uh, huge collecting area of the SKA. The same goes for looking at um, colliding wind binaries, where, for instance, one might have a neutron star or a black hole with a massive stellar companion looking, for instance, in this case, at the, for instance, pulsar wind rabbing into the wind of the companion star, creating a shock. Uh, we can uh, stu study particle acceleration in these systems. They're really laboratories for understanding particle acceleration uh, in a way that we can't do in other environments. Uh, we can study the radio emission from tidal disruption events. So when stars get too close to a supermassive black hole at the center of their galaxies and, uh, and get ripped apart and that stream of material can also create shocks, internal shocks that we can detect in the radio. Uh, we can consider flare stars, so active, magnetically active stars in our own galaxy, like M dwarfs, for instance, very low mass stars, which are incredibly abundant in our galaxy, like the majority of stars in our galaxy are obviously very low mass stars. And we can use radio as a means for, for measuring their magnetic fields and also the impact that these stars have on their planetary systems, which is, of course, very interesting for understanding uh, the conditions for, for habitability in other planetary systems. And perhaps maybe the most exciting thing, although I won't say a lot about it, is, is of course the unknown. By, by building a much larger telescope, by probing new parameter space, uh, you know, the prospects for, for finding unexpected things are become, uh, become very high. I would argue that uh, the SK, in terms of uh, doing transients with the SK, can benefit enormously from adding uh, VLBI. Uh, to, to the equation as well. And I, in fact, I gave a talk about this last week at the SKA uh, VLBI conference. 
on behalf of the Transient Science Working Group. And especially you know, with the, the, the mid array, which will be built in South Africa, linking that to the very nice radio telescopes that we have in Europe currently that are part of the European VLBI network, I think this can be scientifically even more powerful if the SK brings in these long baselines. And that's because you know, anything that is transient in nature is going to be compact. If it's varying on short time scales, then the, you know, the size of the emitter cannot be particularly large. And there are so many advantages to just going to the, you know, the extremes of angular resolution that one can achieve in radio astronomy. And this includes, of course, uh, you know, tracking motions, re resolving sources, looking at proper motions. Um, there's great science that you can do with this um, if we can connect the SKA to, uh, to the long baselines that we have in Europe. You might be wondering, you know, what kind of frequencies does one want to do this type of science at? And of course, uh, the, the five to 10 gigahertz band, what uh, radio astronomers will call the C and the X band, these are really workhorse frequencies for, for studying transients because uh, a lot of transients, given their spectrum and, uh, and variabil variability timescales, and also, you know, if you want to go to very high angular resolution, these are, these are kind of the best balance in terms of sensitivity and, and angular resolution that you can achieve. But I would also argue that, uh, you know, not only is SKA mid going to be interesting for transients, SKA low uh, has huge prospects for, for looking at coherent transients. So if you're looking at synchrotron emission from transients, things like, uh, you know, jets from, uh, from accreting sources, obviously I think there are big advantages to going to higher frequencies. But if you're looking at coherent transients, things like pulsars or fast radio bursts, uh, there are a lot of advantages for going towards lower frequencies partly because these sources typically have fairly steep spectra so that they become brighter at lower frequencies, but also because, you know, the huge collecting area and huge field of view that SK low is going to offer opens up a really large parameter space compared to what we can currently probe with our existing telescopes. So think about, you know, not only FRBs and pulsars, also think about low frequency emission from flare stars, possibly direct emission from exoplanets as well. Very exciting to go to low frequencies as well as the mid frequencies. One of the things that makes uh, transient science a little bit unique compared to other science cases for SK is the fact that uh, transients, you know, being on sky at the right time is scientifically really crucial in many cases. So we need a telescope that is really responsive. This is a key technical capability of the telescope to be able to get on to interesting sources when they're doing interesting things. Uh, a great, you know, a premier example of that obviously is, you know, if you have a gravitational wave event, you want to be on source as quickly as possible. You want to figure out exactly where the source is on the sky and you want to keep monitoring it. This needs to be automated at some level. And, and what's going to be very interesting in the coming decade is that we're going to have to get really picky and choosy as well, because we're in the regime right now where to a certain degree, the most interesting transient astrophysical events, they can be followed up in, in reasonable detail. But we're entering a new regime as a field in the coming decade with facilities like the, uh, the LSST or also known as Vera Rubin uh, Observatory. We're going to be getting, you know, millions of triggers per night and fishing through those those triggers and thinking about, you know, what what are the most interesting things to be spending telescope time on is a non trivial exercise uh, in its own right. You want to cast a broad net so you can be surprised about interesting things, but you don't have enough available telescope time on the SK or any other facility to follow up millions of, of astrophysical transient events every single day. So this is an interesting challenge for us in the coming decade. Uh, add to this the fact that, you know, getting quick observations of interesting astrophysical transients is, uh, is scientifically uh, important. Getting on source quickly is in many cases uh, quite, quite valuable. But at the same time, monitoring sources, continuing to look at them after they've had an outburst, or of course, there are many types of sources that have periods of activity and quiescence. You want to track these things and having high cadence observations. So doing regular monitoring, uh, ideally in a way that is agnostic about what the source is doing, just have a regular cadence of, of monitoring because you might be surprised by uh, the source becoming more active or less active at certain times, this also becomes critical. And this is a challenge for telescopes like the SKA because you want to be doing wide field deep surveys for a variety of different science cases, but you also want to be going back to certain targets over and over again uh, and monitoring uh, you know, their flux density, their polarimetry, their, their spectrum as a function of time. And this is why in our science case, you know, sometimes we're not limited by the sensitivity of the telescope. 
So in, for certain types of applications, the SK is, is too large a telescope. And then you have to start thinking of creative ways in which you can split off parts of the telescope. You can take subarrays of the telescope, for instance, you know, 10, 10 dishes from the telescope that are constantly monitoring interesting sources that have uh, active periods and that are bright enough that you can see with a very small subset of the telescope. But the interesting science comes from the fact that you're looking at them at a very high cadence. And I'll give you a very nice example of that later in the talk as well, where, you know, sensitivity is not the key, key uh, limitation. It's, it's more how often can you be looking at these sources. So in terms of observing strategy, um, I think you know it's clear that both SK mid and SK low uh, through the the surveys that they're going to be doing for other science cases, continuum uh, surveys to, to map the sky, polar metric surveys, um, you know H1 surveys to, to map the gas and other galaxies. Um, we as a transients uh, uh, community, we want to be piggybacking on all of those observations. We want to use all of those observations to discover new transients in SKA data and then trigger internally on those, on, on those new discoveries to do follow-up observations. I think we want to do this not only using the capability of the telescope to make very deep, high angular resolution images of the sky, but the SK is also being developed to be a telescope that provides very high time resolution for surveys of, of pulsars and also to search for, for fast radio bursts. The telescope is going to offer also a very high resolution in the temporal domain as well. And we want to you know, follow up on radio flashes that we detect in pulsar surveys and, and, and fast radio burst surveys, make images of those areas to see you know, what, what, uh, what is going on in that region of the sky. Maybe we can find uh, you know, the afterglow of, uh, of uh, a long gamma ray burst, for instance, or maybe we can find uh, radio emission from, from a host galaxy, um, you know, radio emission due to star formation where the, the source is, is found. And of course, also uh, react, as I've said already, uh, to these huge numbers of very interesting triggers that are going to be coming from uh, telescopes like the Vera Rubin Observatory in the coming, in the coming decade. So, uh, this is kind of like a broad stroke uh, vision of what the SKA is going to mean in terms of transient science and some of the maybe atypical ways in which I think the transient astronomers are going to want to use the SKA. Again, you know, we think of the, the SKA not only as a monolithic collecting area, we think of it as, you know, a set of collecting area that can be uh, used in, in flexible ways in which we can use maybe subsets of the collecting area to do high cadence observations. Um, and also as a telescope that needs to respond quickly. If this is a science area that you're working in already and you're interested in joining the, the Square Kilometer Array Transient Science Working Group, I uh, very much uh, encourage you to do so. Even if you're only interested in maybe starting to, to do transient radio astronomy or transient multi-wavelength astronomy, you're also very much welcome to join the group. Um, the group is currently chaired by myself and Patrick Vaut. Uh, so just send us an email whether uh, if you would like to join the group and we would be very much uh, happy to have you. So after that kind of, you know, general setting of the stage, uh, I want to dig, you know, deep on one of the scientific topics that I think is going to be very interesting for the SK so that, uh, you know, you get a bit more exposure to, to, to why this science is so interesting and also what kind of impact the SK can have in this area. So I'm going to talk uh, in depth about uh, about fast radio bursts, and given that I, I'm assuming the audience is uh, is fairly broad, I'm going to first motivate what fast radio bursts actually are and give some context uh, for this. So I would assume that a lot of people on the call have probably heard of the Lorimer burst. This is uh, really, in my mind, a seminal moment in uh, in transient astronomy. Uh, it's not so often that astronomers discover, you know, a new new type of astrophysical phenomenon. And Lorimer burst really is, is quite a new and, and surprising thing. So it was discovered in, in 2000. Also looking for single pulses. Um, and what, what they found was a single burst uh, which is now called the Lorimer burst. And what you can see here, this is like a spectrogram or uh, sometimes also known as the dynamic spectrum of this burst. You can see radio frequency here on the Y axis. So this is, uh, you know, the range of radio frequencies that were recorded by, by the, the receiver in the, in the back end. And you can see 
time on the x-axis. And you can see that this radio signal arrived at different times at different radio frequencies. This is due to dispersion. This is a well-known effect in uh, ionized material that the, the speed of light is frequency dependent. So you can see this, uh, this sweep here. The same thing happens for all of the pulsars that we see in our own galaxy. And if you correct for this sweep, so if you were to move back into the, the reference frame of the source, removing this, this sweep, and add all of the frequency channels together, that's what this inset is showing you. It's showing you what the, the broadband signal looks like. And this burst lasted only for a few milliseconds or so. And as I said, you know, this, this type of burst this is very similar to the single pulses that we see from radio pulsars in our own galaxy. So in that sense, uh, it might not at first, uh, first glance seem, seem that, uh, that peculiar, but what is very peculiar about the Lorimer burst and which caught people's uh, interest very quickly was the fact that the amount of delay that we would expect knowing how much ionized material is between stars in our own galaxy, this, this delay uh, would be maximally about this, this amount from our entire Milky Way galaxy. So if this source was within the Milky Way, we would expect that at most, if it was at the edge of the Milky Way, we would see uh, a dispersive delay of about you know, 50, 50 milliseconds or so. And the actual delay that we see is about 11 times larger so there's much larger dispersive delay than we would expect given the material, ionized material in our own galaxy. And this extra dispersive delay, it was attributed to, and we now know correctly, to extra dispersion, not just from our own Milky Way galaxy, but from the intergalactic medium itself. So the idea was, and this was postulated at the time of the discovery of the Lorimer burst, that this source was actually located in a distant galaxy uh, at you know, a significant redshift and that this extra dispersive delay was coming from the ionized material between galaxies, the intergalactic medium. And we now know that this is, this is true. At the time, it was a, a very bold idea because you know why was it such a bold idea to say, well, maybe we can see radio flashes from other galaxies. If we compare this to the radio flashes that we've seen from pulsars, the, the luminosities that we're talking about in terms of fast radio bursts are insanely larger than those from pulsars. So this diagram that you're looking at right now, this is a, a phase space diagram where on the, the X axis, we're looking at the duration of a radio transient. Um, and you can see you know, a whole variety of different types of radio transients. We can talk about the afterglows from supernovae and gravitational wave events. We can talk about uh, magnetized cataclysmic variables. We can talk about flare stars or solar bursts. They have much longer time scales than pulsars. Pulsars have time scales of a few milliseconds or so. That's how long their pulses last typically. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have luminosity. And what you can see is pulsars have, you know, characteristic time scale of a few milliseconds and they have some characteristic luminosity, meaning that we can predominantly only see them from our own galaxy. Knowing the distances to fast radio bursts, we can see that they're factors of about 10 to the 12 more luminous than pulsars. So they have similar time scales. The pulses look similar, but given their distances, they are insanely more luminous than pulsars. And this seemed at the time really quite shocking. You know, how could this be that there are these radio bursts that are 10 to the 12 times more luminous than pulsars? And we now know this to be true. Uh, the field has gotten a lot of interest within the astrophysics community because uh, you know it's a new phenomenon. It's very exciting to, to study a new phenomenon. I would say that the field is also capture the public's imagination as well. Because if, um, you know, for instance, if you search on Spotify for, for the term fast radio burst, you can actually see that there are a number of bands and, and songs that are named fast radio burst. This is, this is actually an album cover for some band where this is a plot that I made for one of our papers that ended up as an album cover apparently. And there's also this uh, song by this band called fast radio burst as well. There's another band called Lorimer burst. It's kind of funny to see. So let me share some, some shocking facts about fast radio bursts just to kind of motivate why these, these are so surprising and, and, and cool to study. So I mentioned that they only last for a few milliseconds. Uh, to put that into context, you know, what is a millisecond? It's kind of hard to imagine what a millisecond is. Well, a millisecond is actually 100 times shorter than the blink of an eye. So these are really ephemeral short duration bursts. We now know that they're created long, long ago in galaxies far, far away. You know, they're, they're at distances of in some cases, billions and billions of light years. So they really are cosmological signals. 
And the amount of energy that they pack, given that they're coming from so far away and we can still detect them with our uh, current uh, radio telescopes, it means that that millisecond duration burst that's carrying as much energy as the sun emits in one day, right? So these are very, very energetic events. Not nearly as energetic as a supernova, I don't mean to, to get that impression, but for, for radio, radio phenomena, this, these are really quite, uh, quite spectacular. And of course, you know, one of the big problems is, or one of the big scientific questions is, is what is producing these radio bursts? And I would say that uh, although we have some good indications that uh, at least a large fraction of FRBs are related to, to magnetar emission, where magnetars are neutron stars that are so highly magnetized that, you know, their energy output is predominantly uh, resulting from the decay of their really, really large magnetic fields. And we're talking about magnetic fields that are about 10 to the 15 times the magnetic field of the sun. So we think that magnetars, which uh, have a picture of the top here, we think that magnetars are probably uh, a very interesting uh, candidate for, for explaining fast radio bursts or some fraction of fast radio bursts. But we at the same time have really quite a bit of evidence that maybe that's not the only solution and that we're maybe actually with the fast radio bursts that we've currently detected seeing uh, emission from a variety of different types of astrophysical sources. And, uh, and this slide is kind of summary, summarizing some of the theories that are out there, some of them more plausible than others, some of them a little bit silly, of course, as well. But there's, there's a large theory space for what FRBs could be coming from. And I think a lot of those theories are actually quite plausible. And given that we're opening such a large new parameter space, I think there's no reason to think that FRBs are all coming from a single type of astrophysical source. I think there's reason to think that by opening this new parameter space, we're actually you know, discovering a number of different types of phenomena at the same time. So that's quite nice. You know, you find a new type of mysterious signal, you want to figure out how it's being produced. Um, that is an interesting scientific question in its own right. Maybe it'll be solved one day, maybe it won't. But regardless of knowing whether uh, fast radio bursts come from magnetars or for, from a variety of different types of sources, maybe we'll never know. What we do know though, is that these radio bursts are again influenced by the material between us and, and the source. And not just the ionized material, but also the magnetic field as well. So compared to say gamma ray bursts, which we can also see from cosmological distances, uh, radio, radio waves are a lot more delicate than, than gamma ray photons, right? They're, they're easily influenced by the intervening material and magnetic field. And that means that, for instance, this dispersion effect that I explained to you earlier on, this, this allows us to measure the total electron column density along the line of sight. So it's a way of kind of weighing the universe. And one of the, you know, the key scientific goals for the square kilometer array is to use fast radio bursts to, to weigh the universe, to, to detect the otherwise invisible baryons between galaxies, which is quite important for understanding the formation of, uh, of, uh, of structure in the universe. We can see effects uh, due to how that material is, is distributed, so how clumpy the material is along the line of sight. So whereas dispersion gives us the total electron column density, uh, effects like scintillation and scattering tell us how it's distributed along the line of sight, whether it's in clumps or whether it's homogeneous along the line of sight. And effects like Faraday rotation, because we can also measure polarization in these radio bursts, they allow us to measure the, the line of sight magnetic field. So we can, we can measure the magnetic fields and halos of galaxies and the, in the intergalactic medium. And we know that you know, magnetism has a key role also in structure formation uh, in the universe. So really, you know, every fast radio burst that we detect, you know, we're here somewhere in the Milky Way, this burst is happening in some host galaxy very far away. Um, it is being influenced by the interstellar medium and the circumgalactic medium of that host galaxy. It's being influenced by the intergalactic medium, by maybe uh, the circumgalactic medium of a galaxy that happens to be a long line of sight. And it's also probing the halo of our own galaxy and the interstellar medium of our own galaxy. The, so FRBs are really fantastic. They're, they're unique probes of the intervening me medium, which is otherwise unaccessible to us, otherwise invisible to other types of observations. And uh, what's also great is that fast radio bursts are really quite abundant. And there's now thousands that are known. The all sky rate is really quite astounding. So we think that there are thousands of fast radio bursts happening somewhere on the sky every single day. So you can probably um, you know, immediately come to the conclusion that, well, that must mean that radio telescopes have very small fields of view. If we've only found a few thousand, if there's 
thousands happening every day, that's because we're only scanning very small fractions of the sky at any given time. And again, you know, radio astronomy, one of the, the great growth areas for radio astronomy in the coming decade is by expanding fields of view to detect rarer types of phenomena. And I think especially uh, SK low, its huge field of view is going to make huge gains, uh, gains there by, by, being a, by being able to, you know, ca cast a broad net over a very wide range of, uh, of sky. You know, we're going to be detecting things where the limitation is how often those things happen as opposed to how big the telescope needs to be. So um, in the last years, you know, one, one of the main developments in the fast radio burst field has been the detection of, uh, of a repeating fast radio burst source. So this was discovered with the, uh, the Arecibo telescope, which unfortunately, uh, I'm sure many people know uh, uh, the platform of the Arecibo telescope collapsed. Uh, um, and that is very sad and, we're, you know, it's really a shame that, you know, the, the instrument was such a, uh, still such a uh, cutting edge instrument. It's really a shame to see uh, what is, what has happened to, to the telescope in the last, uh, last year and a half. But uh, in happier times, Arecibo, uh, you know, laid claim to this really quite important discovery, I think, the discovery of the first re known repeating fast radio burst source. And it's not so often in science that you know you have an observation which so clearly uh, differenti differentiates between you know certain classes of theory because i would say at this time at the time of the discovery of this repeating source a lot of the theories uh, around fast radio bursts were invoking cataclysmic events you know one time only explosions like neutron stars smashing into each other or supernova as being the origins of fast radio bursts and uh, that could be true True for some fraction of fast radio bursts, but for any source that's repeating, it cannot be a one-time only event, right? Um, so we know that there's a class of repeating fast radio bursts that must, must come from some kind of energy source that can sustain its activity for, for at least years. And, uh, and this is one of the reasons why we think magnetars are potentially an important uh, um, part of uh, solving the FRB puzzle. Now, to use FRBs as probes and also to really nail down what the energetics are actually like and also to figure out, you know, what kind of environments they occur in, obviously you want to localize them very precisely. You want to figure out what direction on the sky they're coming from and you want to then associate them with the host galaxy where you can get, for instance, the redshift of the host galaxy. And this is, this is another area of radio astronomy which is really quite interesting, I think, in the sense that radio astronomy is a fantastic technique for localizing sources very precisely using long baselines and using interferometry. And to put the, the problem into context, you know, if, if you detect a, a fast radio burst with a telescope like Arecibo, the, the field of view of, the, of a single dish telescope like Arecibo, um, you know, there are many, many potential candidate galaxies within that type of field of view of a few arc minutes or so. And you really need to localize FRBs down to the arc second level or potentially even better than an arc second precision to really nail down unambiguously which galaxy they're coming from. So you need a, a radio interferometer to do that. So I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail uh, uh, in some of the coming slides. But, you know, the first time that this was done was for this for this repeating source. Right where um, Arecibo made the detection of the source, then using the VLA uh, interferometer, it was possible to localize some of the sources on the sky to arc second precision using very long baseline interferometry. So using the telescopes we have here in Europe, which span longer baselines, we were able to, to localize the source to, to milli arc second precision. And knowing that position on the sky very precisely, then you can look in that same direction with, uh, with large optical telescopes like uh, Gem and I, in this case, you can detect the host galaxy, you can measure its spectrum, you can get the redshift, and you can know uh, in, uh, in an independent way what the actual distance to the source is. And then you can take this even farther, right? You can, you can try and match the milli arc second resolution that's possible with radio astronomy with the best possible optical observations at the time that was, uh, was the Hubble Space Telescope, which in this case found that this fast radio burst is localized to a, a dwarf galaxy, a dwarf galaxy where there is ongoing uh, star formation and the FRB seems to be right on top of that uh, uh, ongoing star formation, suggesting that it's a young, young source, which maybe comes as, as little surprise that it would be some young en energetic source. 
But this is again, you know, something that the SKA is going to be able to do in one package, right? Because the SKA is going to be doing these wide field searches at high time resolution, which are capable of detecting fast radio bursts. But then at the same time, it provides the angular resolution, uh, sufficient, you know, angular resolution given the long, long-ish base baselines of the telescope that it will be possible to pinpoint where these 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 signals are coming from and to match that with multi-wavelength data to figure out the host galaxy to, to study the, the local environment, et cetera. Yeah, and yeah, again, one of the cool things uh, about uh, these sources and about radio astronomy is that radio waves, again, are so you know sensitive to everything along the line of sight. One of the nice things about the source is we could also measure Faraday rotation. So that's the, the rotation of the linear polarization angle of the, of the signal as a function of frequency and basically measure the magnetic field in the local environment of the source and show that it's potentially in a very dense nebula. Again, consistent with the idea that it's you know in the star forming region and it's a very young source. Now, localizing uh, localizing FRBs has, has really uh, made huge strides in the last uh, in the last few years. There are now interferometers that are uh, not just following up repeating sources; they're 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 detecting and they're localizing fast radio bursts in kind of near real time. And again, this is something that the SKA is going to do in spades. Uh, when it is available. And this has shown us, uh, we've now localized about 20 FRBs quite precisely to their host galaxies. And I would not say that this has solved the mystery of what F FRBs are. It's actually shown us that FRBs seem to occur in quite a broad range of environments. And I'll show you a very striking example in a, in a few slides. But uh, uh, in doing so, we found FRBs in a variety of different types of environments. And again, this, I think in my mind, this is consistent with the idea that actually in trying to solve the puzzle of what's producing FRBs, we're starting to realize that maybe it's not just one, there's not just one answer to that question, right? So um, I am cognizant of the time. I would like to finish in the next 10-ish minutes or so. I'd like to show you, um, some of the kind of the, the most recent results that we've been doing here uh, in the Netherlands, uh, in our research group that we call AstroFlash. I'm not going to, to, to present all of the, the stuff that we've been working on recently, but I'm going to show a few highlights because I think they're also very nicely illustrative of, of what's going to be possible with the SKA. The first is, you know, localizing the positions of fast radio bursts again to milli arc second uh, precision, which is really quite phenomenal. Um, we're currently doing that, this by, by, by playing on the strengths of, uh, of the CHIME telescope, which is really the world's best uh, discovery machine for fast radio bursts. This is a very wide field telescope in Canada where uh, it's possible to discover a few fast radio burst sources every single day because the field of view of the telescope is so large. It's about 200 square degrees, which compared to a typical radio telescope is a factor of a thousand larger than the field of view of a typical telescope. So CHIME is finding a lot of, of FRBs, but CHIME, because uh, in its current configuration is it's just a single, um, uh, single kind of like a single dish telescope, the angular resolution is still quite limited. We've been taking the sources that are known to repeat and we've been doing follow-up observations using what I would argue is the world's most precise uh, FRB localization machine, and that's that's currently the, the European VLBI network. So this allows us to to refine the positions of repeating fast radio burst sources by factors of a billion in terms of the sky area that we can constrain them to. So zooming in on these positions, for instance, we've done this for a, a, a Chime FRB source where we zoom in and we find the host galaxy, this beautiful kind of face on spiral galaxy at uh, at a distance luminosity distance of about 150 megaparsecs and not only do we identify the host galaxy but we really pinpoint where within the host galaxy where the source is so with follow up observations with the hubble space telescope you can again see this galaxy it's now you know crisper image because we're this is space based opti optical observations but it's possible in radio astronomy to, you know, to measure these positions so precisely that we can see um, that this source of fast radio bursts is very close to a region of active star formation, which uh, has recently actually been argued to, to have been uh, created, this local star forming uh, uh, activity uh, by a minor merger in the, in the past. And we can see that the source is quite close to this 
uh, area of active star formation, but is actually visibly offset. It's offset by a, a couple hundred parsecs, suggesting that the source is a relatively young source, but perhaps not as young as many theories would uh, postulate. It certainly seems like the source is, uh, is not from you know, some kind of delayed channel of, of neutron stars merging together, but at the same time, it's not some, you know, just born in the last, you know, few tens of years, uh, ultra magnetized neutron star. It's quite plausibly actually some type of interacting binary that could potentially be a few hundred thousand, if not a million years old or so. Now, I've alluded to this before. This is one of the nicest things uh, that I uh, have to show uh, today, I think, is um, the, the CHIME telescope discovered a repeating fast radio burst source towards the, the famous M81 galaxy, uh, this you know, grand design spiral that uh, uh, covers a huge area of sky <clears throat> and is at a distance of only a few, few megaparsecs. This is uh, the, uh, the uh, founder of our institute here in the Netherlands, Jan, Jan Oort, uh, standing in front of uh, an older picture of, of M81. Now, Chime found this, this interesting source in, in the direction of M81 it would be a very, very nearby fast radio burst source compared to most fast radio bursts if it's only at a few megaparsecs. And we were lucky enough to, to be able to detect it using uh, this VLBI network, detected a number of bursts and localized it to milli arc second precision. And we're really incredibly surprised to see that the source is on top of a globular cluster, so a, a you know, a neighborhood of old stars, which is part of the M81 galactic system. So it's a globular cluster that has been known for decades to be a globular cluster associated with the M81 galaxy. And it was a huge shock to find a fast radio burst source in a globular cluster because, you know, many lines of evidence lead to the idea that this must be some type of very young source, yet we're finding this, this source in this, you know, kind of stellar graveyard of a globular cluster. One of our hypotheses is maybe that the source was it is indeed a magnetar, but a magnetar then formed through binary merger or through uh, accretion induced collapse in the cluster because, you know, in the core of a globular cluster, the stellar densities are so large that you can have interactions between stars, you can have mergers, you can have uh, mass, uh, mass transfer from one star to another. That's certainly uh, a viable hypothesis, I think, but maybe the source is something completely entire, uh, entirely uh, something different. Maybe it's some type of accreting neutron star or accreting black hole, and maybe the bursts that we're seeing are coming from from uh, a radio jet. So um, just a few other points that I want to make in the last uh, five or six minutes uh, to kind of bring this back uh, towards what the SK is going to offer. Um, one of the other breakthroughs in the field of fast radio bursts in the last uh, few years has been the discovery of a if an incredibly bright, like a mega Jansky radio burst uh, from a galactic magnetar, the galactic magnetar in 1935 uh, plus 2154. And why is this important? Well, we saw a, a radio burst from this known galactic magnetar. So we know it's a magnetar uh, because it's close, close by enough that we've been able to study it in detail. Um, this radio burst was so bright that if this magnetar was in a nearby galaxy, we would have seen it uh, still with our radio telescopes, and, and it would have looked very much like a fast radio burst. So this is one of the, the primary reasons why people say, you know, a significant fraction of fast radio bursts must be coming from magnetars, because we've seen a fast radio burst-like event from a magnetar in our own galaxy just in the last couple of years. Um, I argue that it's important for the SKA to be able to do high cadence observations at lower sensitivity, and I think this is a nice illustration of that point. So we followed up that source after this bright radio burst happened. We basically stared at this galactic magnetar for hundreds and hundreds of hours using very small European radio dishes that are part of the European VLBI network. So these are tiny telescopes compared to the SK. Um, and we stared at the source for, I think it was about three, three, three billion milliseconds. And we saw about one and a half milliseconds of signal during those three billion milliseconds. So I think this really nicely illustrates that uh, our ability to probe very rare astrophysical events is not always sensitivity limited. It's limited by how much on-sky time we can spend. And I think there's a lot of valuable science that one can do if, um, if you think creatively about how you can use an infrastructure uh, like the SK, not just to do the very deep high sensitivity 
uh, high precision observations that uh, that it was originally built for, but also for doing high cadence observations. Where being on sky and searching through, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of data make the make the difference. Because what's quite interesting about this this additional detection of of more bursts from the source is the fact that you know coming back to this this transient phase space that I was showing you early in the talk, we have the pulsars here, we have the fast radio bursts here. We've now seen radio bursts from this galactic magnetar that actually span seven orders of magnitude in terms of their luminosity. And they really bridge from the pulsars all the way up to the fast radio burst. So by being able to do these low sensitivity, high cadence observations, I think we've come to the conclusion that this known neutron star, known magnetar in our own galaxy, it can produce radio bursts that can be as weak as pulsars and as bright as the dimmest fast radio bursts. And you could ask yourself the question, you know, at one point, the, does, does the emission stop being uh, fast radio burst-like and, and start becoming uh, pulsar-like or vice versa? But it's basically demonstrated that a single neutron star can produce a, a wide range of, of luminosities, wide range of phenomena, and, uh, and provides a, you know, a very plausible link between these, these two populations. And uh, I don't have time to go into detail about it now, but you know, in our, uh, our group here in Amsterdam, uh, we've really been trying to fill in this parameter space, looking at timescales of milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds. We've been looking at fast radio burst sources and trying to really fill in this parameter space and understand you know, what, what types of astrophysical events and, and sources uh, exist, not only on these ranges of, of luminosities, but also on these huge orders of magnitude ranges in, uh, in timescale as well. So um, maybe just one other quick point before I start concluding. Um, I think SKA low, as I mentioned before, is also going to be an interesting, a very interesting transient machine. Uh, SKA low has gotten a lot of attention for in terms of searching for, for galactic uh, radio pulsars, and I think it's going to be a fantastic discovery machine for galactic radio pulsars. I would argue that it's actually also going to be a very interesting FRB discovery and study machine as well. And that's because just in the last year, we've been able to discover the, uh, the first bursts from a fast radio burst that are visible at low far frequencies and also visible you know, at, at SKA low uh, type frequencies. And this is interesting because these very low frequencies allow you to probe the, the local environment even more precisely. Here are some examples of, of those bursts. And I think we've really just scratched the surface of this area of the parameter space where we're talking about, you know, pushing in the dimension of not, uh, you know, time scale or luminosity or on sky time. We're talking about pushing in the dimension of radio frequency. And I think uh, we know very little about uh, coherent radio transients that could be very steep spectrum and be very well detected with SK low. So um, in conclusion, um, I'd like to say that uh, I think this is a very exciting time for transient radio astronomy. I've been in the field long enough to uh, to have you know witnessed the you know the early promises about how interesting it was going to be, and it took many years for people to start discovering interesting radio transients. But I think we're very much in the regime now where we are getting a lot of traction and making uh, some very serious scientific discoveries through uh, radio observations of transients. And to put this into context, you know, the parameter space in terms of, in this case, field of view and sensitivity that we've probed up to this time with systems like the Parkes Multibeam System and the Chime Telescope that I mentioned uh, is really quite restricted. And we talk about, you know, SKA type sensitivities over large fields of view. The, the parameter space for new discoveries is enormous. So it would be shocking if there aren't other FRB like type signals out there that uh, uh, are still to be discovered given the large uh, sensitivity of the SK and uh, its wide field of view. And I would say, uh, you know, other uh, dimensions of parameter space that are going to be interesting to, to investigate are really the, the range of radio frequencies. So using both SK mid and SK low to search for short duration radio transients, both on very short time scales, which will be possible using the non-imaging modes of the, the square kilometer array, but also on uh, conversely on long time scales. So looking for radio transients with durations of like one second or just a few seconds, that area of the parameter space is very, very poorly explored because whereas, you know, we've been searching for decades for radio pulsars on millisecond time scales, very few searches have been done on time scales of hundreds of milliseconds or seconds or tens of seconds. And there must be 
uh, a whole host of astrophysical transient uh, phenomena out there to be discovered still. So thank you very much. I mean, in conclusion, I think uh, uh, the, the future for transient science in general with the SK is very bright. Uh, I focus mostly on fast radio bursts because I wanted to go deep on at least one topic. Um, you know, the high event rate, uh, the fact that radio is an exceptional probe of intervening material, the, I think it means that, uh, you know, the, the, the long term, the longevity of this field is, is, is really secured. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, Teresa, I'll, I'll pass it over to you if you want to handle the questions or host the questions. Okay, thank you very much, Jason, for this wonderful talk. And uh, yeah, now the talk is open for questions, comments. Please raise your hand and Teresa will manage for all this section. Please, Teresa. Okay. Hi, Jason. I, um, I think it's very nice to see you in person and uh, thank you so much for such an awesome talk. And I just wanted to say that as I was preparing Jason's proposal for, for this colloquium, uh, this is a topic, his topic is very far from my own research, but very close to my SKA work here at the IAA. So I got really excited to hear from him to speak about this topic and how the SKA will be of benefit for it. So. I also was hoping to hear a fair amount on FRBs because it's an area I got interested in after writing some outreach article on it and I definitely was not disappointed and I don't think anyone else was either. Great talk. And uh, I'm also quite excited that we share Canada as our country of uh, doctoral studies. So <laughs> is it uh, possible for me as leading this to start up with two questions <laughs> and be so bold? As you want, Teresa. Okay, first one is very important. Uh, I was wondering, that plot that ended up as an album cover, apart from the honor of being involved with that, did you get any other credit? And I did not. <laughs> no? no, I don't I don't think they even said where it came from, actually. It's okay. a little bit less famous than the Joy Division uh, album cover that is Pulsar-based, but I received no royalties of any kind. Uh, was the music any good at least? No, the music was terrible as well. So that made me feel better <laughs> about it actually. Okay, so it wasn't bad. Okay, so my other question is a bit of a broad question aimed for you as, as a co-chair of the, of the um, SKA working group. Um, I, because of my work, I'm always very interested in synergy opportunities. So I was wondering how might uh, SKA transient observations be useful for uh, um, other areas of SKA research and uh, opposite, how can the data from uh, other areas be possibly be used for, for transient research uh, work? And uh, so what, uh, what, what specific areas can mainly be benefiting from or be a benefit for these data? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, the, the most obvious answer is, is first how we can benefit from other people's data, because I think the um, uh, transient science in, in, in some respects is really uh, driven by exploring new parameter space and hence having access to the maximum possible data set. So, so doing commensal transient searches on every bit of SKA data that's taken primarily for other science like, you know, H1 observations, uh, looking at gas and galaxies. Uh, um, we, will, we will benefit quite a bit from that because, you know, it's, it's a hard cell to say give us thousands of hours of telescope time maybe we'll find something maybe we won't but if we can do that for free and someone else is motivated you know we need thousands of hours to look at these galaxies then then that'll work but how do we pay them back for that uh for that opportunity i would say um i think uh as we explore the data on second time scales uh we're going to be finding uh artifacts in in the data and in the calibration of the data that are, are going to be creating false positives for us. And that could be potentially interesting for people who are, are looking on longer timescales and just trying to make accurate images because it could also have effects on the image quality, the accuracy uh, for that those other science cases as well. Okay, thank you. Um, if you close the sharing the screen, maybe we can see everyone. Uh, oh yeah, sure. Who yeah, is I'd the... be happy to stop sharing, yeah. <laughs> And then I can see whose hands are up. Okay, I see Anton. Hi, Jason, how are you? Hi. It was a, 
a very nice talk and a very beautiful presentation, by the way. Thank you. Really thanks a lot. And in fact, we have seen a lot of new results and with exciting science in all of them. Then really, thanks a lot. Um, I have a lot of questions, but let me ask you yes one. Uh, it's about the result of the repeating FRB towards M81, the one that is on top of a global cluster. First, some details. You, you said that this is a repeating FRB, which is the typical duration of each period of activity. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, we have some indications that maybe the 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 activity will will be going up and down periodically. There is one repeating source where we see that quite clearly at uh, a period of 16 days. And I think that source could very potentially be a high mass uh, uh, binary system. In this case, we don't have a periodicity, but we very clearly see that the activity goes up and down. I mean, sometimes we'll observe for tens of hours, see nothing, and then we'll observe for half an hour and get 40 bursts from the source. And the last thing I'll say about the source, I didn't have time to present everything, obviously, but one of my students published a paper yesterday where she showed that uh, these bursts can be as narrow as about 60 nanoseconds or so. So again, this shows that, you know, by probing in, in different timescales as well, that there's probably a lot of transient phenomena out there that we're just currently blind to in our standard observations. Mm -hmm. And what about the image? And the image you have shown that the yeah. one that, that uh, permits a very precise localization. Uh, can you give some details about the total uh, observing time of, for this image and things like that? Yeah, so what we do is uh, we, we do continuum observations over the course of hours. Oh. Um, so we, we can make you know a continuum map of the field uh, to see if there's any persistent radio emission. And we do that on timescales of, uh, of hours or so. And there is there are a few repeating sources where there is actually a radio source at the same position as well, which we think might be some kind of very extreme nebula around the source. In this case, we don't see that. Um, but uh, then we take the individual bursts where each burst is lasting for only like a fraction of a millisecond in this case. And then what we do is we, we, we produce a gate of the visibilities at each one of those burst times. So the total like integration time is literally just a few milliseconds or so. Yeah, but in, during that millisecond, it's the brightest source in the field for that one millisecond. And unfortunately, we have those bursts at different times during the observation. So the Earth is rotated. So we have good UV coverage then, or better UV coverage, because we can link different bursts detected at different times together. OK, thanks a lot. And I hope to see you in person again very soon. Yeah, me okay. too. Nice seeing you. OK, next up is uh, Rainer. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, very nice talk. I enjoyed it a lot. Learning stuff, it's not my field. So did you just say 16 nanose nanoseconds, Jason? 15 nanoseconds, yeah. That's a few meters. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So what, what is, why is that scientifically is interesting? It boosted or yeah. Doppler boosted, there must be some extreme relativistic effect at play here. I mean, with a few meters, you can't get these energies. Uh, yeah, so so uh, there are probably there is probably some length contraction time dilation effects to take into account as well. We don't know what the Lorentz factor is. Uh, we see the same from the crab pulsar in our own galaxy. It can actually produce uh, giant pulses that are even shorter than a nanosecond. Bloody hell. Yeah, exactly. And that, <laughs> you know, that's you know, the size of a football, right? Um, and you know, so why was this scientifically important? This is scientifically important because there's a class of models that say FRBs are happening in the magnetosphere of a neutron star. And there are models that say the neutron star creates some explosion and then it creates a shock much further out where the, the fast rate of bursts are being generated. And what we've argued is that it seems more natural that the bursts are being produced close to the neutron star because the emitting region needs to be so small to, to explain these very short time scales compared to, you know, much further out in a shock, which is much larger and where it's harder to explain why would it only last for, for 60 nanoseconds or so. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any more questions? Isabel. Thanks a lot, Jason. It has been great. It's not my, my field of expertise either, so that's uh, great to learn a lot of things. Um, I have a question just concerning maybe terminology, because you're talking about the transient sky, so you, uh, as far as I've understood, you mean less than one second? Is not necessarily. Right? No, not necessarily. I think there, there's interesting transient signs to be, be done by looking at catalogs that span decades. 
because I, I'm, 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 I work in the field of AGN. So I was thinking yeah. about them in all, all the, the work we have been done in, in AGN variability, mainly using X-ray data. So it should, it, I mean, it should be great to have the, uh, the, the add of, of radio frequencies to, to try to understand how AGN vary. But, but as far as the uh, SKA is concerned and, and the, uh, I mean, the data that is needed, I don't know if there is any kind of approach that would, will consider those, those kind of objects in which the variability is taking its much, much longer uh, yeah, period. Yeah, definitely. Well, there's certainly going to be fields that are observed over and over again, where it will be possible to, to create light curves for sources that are more I would say variable than transient, and, transient. and, and you exactly. want to do that over timescales of decades, eventually, right? And there, there, are, that has there has been monitoring of AGN done, right, with the uh, with small radio uh, dishes, and there are databases of thousands and thousands of AGNs where, for decades and decades, you have the radio brightness as a function of time. Thank you, and and, and again, will it, it, it'll be a pleasure for us to have you here. Yeah, I'm looking forward Thanks. to this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, do we have any more questions? We're all just excited about what we just uh, heard here. And uh, no, I don't see anything. Over oh, back to you, Rene, then. So, okay, thank you, Teresa. And just for closing the talk, thank you, Jason, again. Hope to see you here in October. And uh, thank you very much for the talk. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. It was fun. Okay, take.